Diva, how are you? Hello, darling Diva. So I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Happy, happy mid-January. There's nothing to celebrate in this awful <laughs> month. Oh God, I know. I was having a chat with a friend recently and we were just going in on the fact that we think that the new year should start at the beginning of April. Sure. Where like, I feel like, you know, new year, new beginnings, starting in spring makes sense. What about a new year is fun when it's dark, miserable, cold and wet? Nothing. I think Chinese New Year's kind of got it right. 10th of February. Yeah, 10th of February. I think that's way better. I th- I'd say pushing it even better. I'd say 1st of April. 1st of April. <laughs> Push it back further. The tax year. We should make it the tax year. Yeah, sure. The financial year is now <laughs> is now the official year. Um, yeah, I only operate in terms of FY2324. <laughs> and hello to you, dear listener. How are you feeling this week? Uh, do let us know at Hula La Pod. Uh, my name's Alistair. My name's Sam. And this is a Doctor Who podcast. If you are new here, uh, we talk about Doctor Who every week. Um, and when we're lucky enough to have Doc 2 on the TV, <laughs> we talk about new episodes, yeah. but in the in-between, we revisit some of our favourite episodes from the past, or we pick topics, like today, where we've picked a handful of companions to carry on our series, where we've been talking about um, some of our favourite companions from the revival era. Exactly. Episodes 44 and 45 of Hula La, we look back on Rose, Sarah Jane, Martha and Donna. Those are some fun episodes if you want to jump back and have a listen. And originally, I think we were only going to talk about those because we were leading up towards the 60th and, you know, it was Russell's era and uh, Donna was coming back. And everyone, every one of you people listening, you just kept shouting us. Bullying works. You said, you've got to do Amy, you've got to do Riv, you've got to do Clara, you've got to do more. And who are we to say no? It's funny as well. I was saying to you, Sam, it's it's actually, it requires a little bit of homework because it's been a while since I actually sat down to watch an episode with Amy, Rory and River and to actually kind of like form an opinion <laughs> on that era <laughs> that you could actually bother articulating. It it takes it takes a little bit of research. I had to go back and watch um, a couple of episodes. I watched the series five Pandora Opens two parter. Mm-hmm. Went back as well through the handy dandy TARDIS wiki, mm-hmm. and of course, as we have done for all the other companions, we've written a little biography for you as well, so that you can learn all about that companion's journey before we start talking about them as well. Yeah, I had a slightly different route for my research. I was going through the episode list generally. I was trying to work out, you know, like how many episodes River Song have been in what arcs amy and rory had generally i didn't rewatch a particular episode but there are actually if anyone wants to refresh well if anyone wants to refresh their memories you should listen to this episode of Hula La, of course um but on youtube there's actually some really good episodes there's some really good videos of people that kind of encapsulate the entire era in like five ten minutes and i mean i kind of forget because i feel like i'm such a rtd girly that We were saying this before, we properly grew up on like Matt Smith's era and the era of these companions. And I kind of forget how much I love them until I do revisit them. So I'm really glad we're doing this for this episode. I'm excited that we've gone back for this as well. I think series five is an era that we've maybe neglected a little bit so far dare i say that we've we've done we've done the premiere episode we did the 11th hour but we haven't got back to anything else so i mean you've recently rewatched the finale would you not want to listen to that oh my god it was fantastic i'd really recommend actually go back i watched it today with my dear partner and he got really into it which surprised me i thought it'd be something that you needed a lot of context to get into and understand but we got to the end of part one he was like oh that was great like can we do the next one? I was like, yeah, we can. Oh my God. Um, I wish that mine was that enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's pretty attentive. So uh, yeah, it was, it was good fun to rewatch that one. And that's great as well, because we're doing Amy, Rory and River today. And this is one of the best two parters I could possibly have done. If you want to see that trio in action and the start of series six as well, would have been another good option that I almost went back to. Um, but a very nice warm up to talk about those three. Exactly. Well, before we go into our thoughts, we did reach out to you on our social media again at Hula Pod on all social platforms uh, and ask what you thought about these companions. And here's what some of you had to say. Matthew Vlosak said, My favourite companions. They were not only your typical travellers with the Doctor, but also his family. This era holds a special place in my heart. It was nice to see the twist in River being their daughter as well. This era felt like a magical family vacation. It does have a family feel, actually, doesn't it? I forget Ooh. how, I mean, very literally a family feel. But they yeah. are they are the Doctor's family for this period, aren't they? Truly. Um, Paddy Who said, By far the best, hardest team of the modern era. To me, it feels like it's the closest we'll ever get to seeing the Doctor with a wife and two kids in a timey-wimey way. Plus, River also teaches every gal in the universe how to leave a party when we get bored. <laughs> she really does. I forget about that. 
Uh, Nick sometimes draws says absolutely golden era surely one of the or the best force and TARDIS teams every one of them is very well rounded in their own right and everyone brings something different the actors too I'm a sucker for a bit of camp timey wimey river songness Laura said I could write a novel on how much I love Amy and Roy to be honest endlessly badass in their own ways and a joy to watch their stories I've genuinely only watched the angels take Manhattan twice as it makes me too emotional to see them leave did I tell you this as well my sister when we watched the angels take Manhattan and they bowed out of the show she sobbed Mm -hmm. so hysterically she was absolutely inconsolable and meanwhile i was just enjoying the soundtrack um (laughs) you stand by this you say i was just enjoying the soundtrack i'm like i was just enjoying the soundtrack sound like a bit of brotherly pushing there (laughs) was not trying to torment my sister uh with this but i was yeah listening to the kind of unreleased soundtrack from there (laughs) from their parting (laughs) just Blasting around loud her. in the house completely coincidentally not not around her but um yeah she she could not watch doc two for a little while after that she was not happy to see them go oh bless her well you know what she didn't have to because we had to wait till christmas for the next one anyway yeah oh, there we are well alistair i think we should kick this off with the first of these characters amelia pond amy pond amy pond well that's all what would the toy maker have <laughs> said for rory and river Rory Williams, except he could just keep sniffing him and he'd keep dying. <laughs> Brings out new puppets. River, he'd be like, River, he'd have like his hands all tangled in strings. He'd be like, River song. He'd be like, I actually don't even know where to start with this one. <laughs> and then she died when she was put into a library. Her mind survives in the cloud. Well, that's all right then. <laughs> Rory Williams, but he got brought back to life. Well, well that's, that's all right, right then. then. Let's get into it. Amy Pond, played by Karen Gillan and Caitlin Blackwood, who is Karen Gillan's cousin, so brings a wonderful, mm-hmm. believable, honest likeness to the role for young Amy. And it's quite interesting as well because, I mean, we'll get into it, but the first time we see Amy is from Caitlin as the actress. And um, I, I like meeting a companion young for like i think it's a, it's a fun interesting introduction to the character yeah it's very cool we get to see amy's entire life play out actually um on the show okay. to a point to to a point to a point to a point but see her from kind of childhood to old age which is interesting <laughs> is everyone sitting comfortably here goes the story right Amy Pond grew up in the fictional town of Ledworth, where her parents were swallowed by the crack in her bedroom wall and erased from time. At primary school, she met her future husband, Rory Williams, and future daughter, Mel, otherwise known as River Song. In 1996, a young Amelia met the newly regenerated 11th Doctor when he crashed in her back garden. After a brief meeting where he examined a crack in her wall, the Doctor zoomed off to repair the TARDIS. While waiting for him to return, Amelia became obsessed with her raggedy Doctor, made besties with Mel, and realised her gay best friend Rory was, in fact, totally in love with her. When the Doctor returned 12 years later than planned, she helped him to defeat Prisoner Zero and the Atraxi before being taken away for a trip in time and space on the night before her wedding. Amy and Rory then travelled together, both died, came back to life, got married, and remembered the Doctor back into existence after he rebooted the universe. In Amy's own words, she went to sea and fought pirates, fell in love with a man who waited 2,000 years to keep her safe, gave hope to Vincent Van Gogh. Is it Van Gogh or Van Gogh? Van Gogh, Van Gogh. I'll say both. (laughs) And saved a whale in outer space. Amy's travels came to a tragic end when she was touched by a weeping angel in New York after shutting down their human farm via a double suicide. Amy was catapulted back to 1938 where she lived happy life with Rory and adopted a son. Well, that's all right then. Well, that's all right then. God, where do we begin? I'll I'll begin. You can begin. Why not? You go for it. I'm jumping in. (laughs) Um... Amy Pond, I mean, this whole era, but this character as well, a huge contrast from the kind of grounded kitchen sink drama companions of past. We go straight into a real fairy tale companion right down to the name. Mm. And it's one of Moffat's companions that we have with a mystery hanging over the head from the get go, surrounded by coincidence, not so dissimilar to the church from Ruby Road Mm -hmm. and Ruby's story so far as well, Yes, which all comes to a head in that Pandorica two-parter, but carries on after that as well. Yeah, no, exactly. I think it's a really original start of the character. I like that you made the distinction there between the characters of Russell's era and of Stephen's era, because it feels like there's often comparison as to like, which is better than the other, but it really is apples and oranges. Because I think that Stephen Moffat dealt with companions in a very different way to Russell T Davies in that the fairy tale-ness of this era is undeniable. And like you said, especially down to the name, I like that it's a completely original introduction to a companion as well, that the doctor, you know, meets him as a child. Um, yeah, it's really cute. They cast her cousin as well. Like you said, it's a really good likeness there. Um, it, 
it does like when I was sort of thinking about this now in today's lens and like the 2024 lens, it does sometimes feel a bit iffy, like the doctor sort of like printing himself onto a child at such a young age that she became like obsessed with him her whole life. Like her whole life was affected by this man mm. who came and like changed her life when she was like 10 or 11. Um, it's also very reminiscent of another Stephen Moff episode, The Girl in the Fireplace, where he meets a young woman when she was a child, sort of imprints on her, and then she grows up obsessed. If I had a nickel. If I had a nickel for every time Stephen Moffat wrote a Doctor Who episode where he imprinted on a young child and she grew up obsessed with him and they end up <laughs> snogging, I'd have two nickels, which is weird, but it happened twice. I feel like snogging is a word that's not Super often said weird. in the American accent. <laughs> snogging. Snogging. <laughs> I said it and I was like, ooh. Snogging. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. It's it's I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. There's something like uh <laughs> how can I even say anything delicately about this topic? <laughs> it's not it's not bad in itself, it's not creepy in itself. It's funny that he went back to it twice. Mm. Um I think in both cases it works well and it doesn't read creepy to me. Mm -hmm. I think if you distill it down to kind of like older man arrives in woman's life as child returns 10 years later and kisses her then it's it's odd yeah um <laughs> but i i don't think that's quite the story that'd be an oversimplification no, of course yeah for sure i yeah. i like one thing i really like in this era it happens with amy it happens with rory it happens with clara um i really like that the companions get like a kind of tagline even though like with clara it comes a, a bit like of a I don't know, it, it gets a bit muddled, but with Amy, I really like that she's the girl who waited. It's like Amy Pond, the girl who waited. Like Martha Jones, the woman who walked the earth. Don Noble, the most important woman of all creation. Like I like, I think that really fits Amy. And one thing that I like is that all throughout her era, that is something that they keep coming back to. And I, I often feel like, in storytelling in general, not just in Doctor Who, sometimes they make a story arc for like one series and then they're constantly like adding to it. Arguably, that sort of was the case for clara once the impossible girl storyline was over and then they had to like build a whole new story um but with amy i feel like once they'd finished the series five story series six then built on it even more and it felt like they were building onto something rather than just kind of tacking stuff on they like that the girl who waited was kind of like interwoven throughout that entire era you're right i like that they keep going back to that i i think just generally as well watching karen gillen on screen she's she's really funny I think yeah. Amy's a very likable companion. She's a great heroine. She's very kick-ass. Um, Amy and Rory together, I think, are a highlight as well. And a lot of people say that as a duo bouncing off each other with with that chemistry, that's that's a highlight. And people say like watching mm. them do anything together is fun. Um, and, and they've got that, like I say, really good, believable, I think, romantic chemistry between the two of them. And there are loads of moments where they really start to shine together on the screen. Mm -hmm. The the bit that's more controversial, I guess, is the way that Amy treats Rory. Uh, but, you know, whether that's mm. like a deliberate character flaw or the way it's delivered or that they slightly kind of over-egg it. Um, she's, she's pretty rude to poor Rory. Rory adores that girl and she really mm. puts that poor man down. Um, and... And and that can get a little bit grating, like the power dynamic that seems to like exist between the two of them. Yeah, when I was thinking about my prep for this episode, I was really trying to put myself back into the mindset of the time. So just to put some dates on this, Amy first appeared in the 11th hour, which was on the 3rd of April 2010, left the show in the Angels Take Manhattan, which was the 29th of September 2012. And then her final appearance was as a cameo in the time of the Doctor in December 2013 for the Christmas special. Um, and I realized that in media at this time, love triangles were such a big thing. I'm mm. thinking Hunger Games, I'm thinking Twilight, I'm thinking Harry Potter. And that was very much like You're a so plot right. point that was used a lot at that time. One thing I'm really glad for is because it definitely featured in this storyline. And I think in series five, especially, there was a real question of like, Amy has to choose the Doctor or Rory. Like Amy has yeah. to choose. And quite solidly by the end of series five, she's made her decision. So that yeah. doesn't really interweave. To, like there's they're still, she always has the love for the Doctor. And it kind of becomes a case of like Rory being like, I know how much you love him but I also know how much you love me. And I know that you will always choose me above him. Mm -hmm. So I understand it's that kind of love. And they didn't really linger on it too much past that. Um, mm. I think that when you have storylines like the crack in series five, when Rory's forgotten, that was actually like a really emotional storyline. It's something we should revisit on the Hulala at some point, because that is what helps through the doctor's eyes. And then through Amy's eyes, when she remembers 
her solidify like oh rory is the one that i love yeah i like that as well that she eventually always comes back to rory um yeah i guess as well it's nice that she doesn't just like rory because rory does so much and because rory likes her so much that that just makes her like him back like oh like i love you because you waited two thousand years for me she kind of she loves him as as rory without that as well obviously the waiting 2000 years assured her of her love for him but it wasn't the reason that yeah she already she already loved her rory she knew she knew when she met centurion rory she starts sobbing she doesn't even know why she's crying she does it's because she's so happy to see him again um exactly what i also really like in terms of how this um uh kind of i think develops the character of the doctor a bit more it kind of helps explain um why does the doctor bring people with him how does he choose people to bring part of it is the mystery and that he's kind of walked into something he can't resist which is whoa you know for amy why did she live in this massive house all by herself or with her aunt looking after her and there's all these rooms that haven't been lived in this is so strange your life doesn't make any sense and then begins to realize that something's really wrong with where she is and that she isn't safe um Mm. but there's also this um I think it's in series six, or maybe it's even series seven. There's a, there's a moment when the doctor and Amy are having a conversation, and he says the reason he takes people is because he can't see it anymore, and he needs a human to kind of experience the wonder of the universe and to see kind of the joy of it through their eyes, and that mm. helps him see how beautiful and amazing the world is by having a human kind of experience for the first time and i think matt smith described that quite well himself saying that it's the doctor kind of rediscovering and experiencing the universe through amy and through her childlike wonder and joy for everything not to quote davina mccall but i love that i love that you do see things more joyfully when you share them with someone right like when you have like a you know a great show like Doctor Who, yeah. and you show someone else and they laugh, you know, or they enjoy it, or they say, oh, actually, that was great. And then you enjoy it so much more because they liked it. Um, even though that's why we all share memes, because we like to make people laugh and share funny moments with them. Of course, <laughs> of course, we want exactly. we want to we see things through their childlike eyes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, speaking of childlike eyes, one thing that I really like about Amy's story is I think arguably more so than any other companion, she grew the most during her tenure so she was in it for two full series and then series 7a so the half of the first half of series 7 i always wonder as well what the contracts must have been with that like did she sign a half contract series mm. like could they not get back before they're like look we'll just do a half one like i i, I always wonder what that was about and um, yes it's she- fine if you shave your wig during that time shave your wig shave your hair <laughs> shave your hair well she didn't <laughs> shave her hair she i think what happened is she shaved her hair right after it was done but then probably in the contract there were a few like extra bits like you know the pond life and stuff because i don't Mm. think she had a wig during the show but then for everything like promotional photos and uh photo shoots and like videos and stuff she's always in the wig she was just wigging for pond life and for matt smith's regeneration where he's also in a wig i love your wig i love your wig too very funny that for matt smith's regeneration the two of them are just bald but (laughs) (laughs) exactly um but yeah i think that she grew the most also in time like literally so there's a scene i think it's in the power of three where she says to the doctor it's been 10 years of you obviously not for you or for earth but for us it's been 10 years for us since we met you and in that time she becomes a mother she becomes a wife she gets divorced she deals with grief loss love all of that like she she i think has to deal with not more than other companions because other companions went through different things but just life she She has so much more life she goes through it like rose i forget was only with the doctor for like two years i mean two years that we're aware of like it's never explicitly said so maybe rose have more years than tardis and we just didn't know but i i like that she i feel like we really see her grow and i think that like when we see her at the beginning in the 11th hour she really is like a young adult she's like in her early 20s she doesn't really know what she's doing she feels very childlike but by the end in series seven she is headstrong and knows who she is and she also understands the doctor like when she tells him this is what happens when you travel by yourself for too long like she is a strong woman by the end of it like a grown woman I really like that little um, conversation they have. I can't remember where it comes in the series, but like, oh, we think it's been 10 years for us. Like, I like that they've had like an off-screen conversation where they try to add it up and they're like, okay, well, that was about a month. 
that was another two months. Then when yeah. we had Henry VIII, that was three days. And then that was, <laughs> and they're trying to like piece it out. Okay, then we came back for a bit. Then we lived here for a year and then we went away again. They don't like know the, how old they are. They, yeah, they're like, I, is it my birthday still? Like, I don't know how old I am. Like that is so, it's so interesting. Like the life of time traveler. Um, and Amy and the doctor really felt like, like real friends. I don't know, something about yeah. like, you know, oh, braggity man and pond it was such a good little double act um and i think a lot of that is fueled by matt smith and karen gillen you know really loving each other i think off screen as well yeah the other arc that i really love for amy is when she has to kind of accept that the doctor as her childhood hero is not infallible and their friendship takes all these hits in series six and she eventually has to like give up her faith in him completely and then there's this hard conversation about the fact that this can't go on forever because I love you both so much. And if this carries on, like, what's the alternative? If we don't stop, like, I'm going to be standing over your dead, broken bodies. And then mm -hmm. in the end, like, he is standing over their grave and that's that's how it ends. So mm -hmm. it's kind of this, like, running on borrowed time and her having to accept the fact that he is just, like, a madman with a box. He is just a traveller passing through who can make terrible mistakes and the first time they met made a terrible stupid mistake like you know went to come back and came back 12 years later you know but she never really accepts that because she has such faith in the doctor um mm -hmm. that's an interesting dynamic i'm glad they explored that as well yeah i feel like they needed that because i think that's what stops it being creepy is that the doctor doesn't treat it like he is this magical person that's there to like save amy and she he's there for her. like for him it was a bit of a screw up that it happened as it happened in Framey. It was the most important thing to have happened in her life, rightfully so. But he has to kind of assure her, like, I'm not magic. I, I can't do anything. I am just my man in a box and I do make mistakes. And and well, this is one of them. Oops. Um, and I think that that is part of the reason. I think it's a very important plot point in Amy's story because, like I was saying, there's the whole love triangle between her and Rory, but there's also the kind of wait for her life in the TARDIS and her life in the real world. And like, which one is more important? I think that she kind of gets forced to by the doctor in the gold complex be put on earth. Like you said, like she would, she, she's saying like, you can't just drop me back and, and, you know, say bye, like we shared a taxi. Like she didn't want to do that. I think Rory was ready to do that, which we'll get into shortly, but I think that she needed that. And then in series seven, it's interesting because they're just visits. These aren't, they're not traveling with the doctor. These are like odd visits. He's popping back every like, so I think at one point she says like, oh, it's been two years since I saw you last. Mm, like mm. it's, it's years. And it, you know, it's just the one adventure. We always talk about it a lot. We talk about it with Clara, we talk about the other companions, but it just ends up being the adventure that went wrong. Yeah. That, that was too much there. And let me tell you, I don't blame your sister because that, the, the joint <laughs> suicide to like create the paradox girl, that broke me. That yeah. broke me. That was hefty the other thing when people say i was having a little bit of a dig online i was trying to like see like what's the consensus on how people feel about the character of amy and as you know digging online about um how a female character has been written is the best way to get an honest accurate view totally joking mm. by the way if that sarcasm <laughs> was missed there um and some people read like oh amy's a little too snarky for me sometimes like sometimes she's a little mm. bit too sharp and sometimes that's aimed in rory's direction and i'm going to be a defender of that because you know what <laughs> girly has got some abandonment issues she lost her parents at unknown age for unknown reason and <laughs> i realized re-watching like the series five finale she doesn't remember why she doesn't have her parents they don't talk about it because the doctor like finally like the doctor's already worked it out the doctor's like way ahead and is like you know like oh man like she has no idea where her parents are does she and mm -hmm. uh and he's like like where are they and he's like don't panic but think about it and she's like oh my god i actually have no idea like when i lost them or who they are i don't know who my parents are and like that that would kind of ingrain itself in the way that you felt about your life and the way you felt about yourself and then, like, the doctor turns up, who's, like, this hero who drops out of the sky. And then he vanishes. And then everyone in her life is, like, he was never there. He can't have been there. Like, you imagined that. And it's Kept biting the psychiatrists. Kept biting the psychiatrists. Um, so, like, wouldn't you be a little messed up if you lost both your parents, couldn't remember why? Oh, and 100%. I'm amazed yeah. that she's as emotionally capable as she is. I love what appears to be a, a totally... Um, 
polyamorous <laughs> Amy Pond. <laughs> like, I'm like, great, why not? Um, in the end, I quite enjoyed it. It was a bit like, whoa, but it was also like, why not? Um, <laughs> one doctor comes back, you may definitely kiss the bride. And it's her own wedding and her husband is right there and her whole family's right there. I'm like, sure, go for it, girl. Yeah. And um, it. when it's like, time to head off on the next adventure and it's like what not even time for snogging in the bushes and it's like oh my god <laughs> your husband's right there um i think it's great great fun uh one last thing i want to say about amy and i don't want to sort of hold this too long because i think we'll talk about it more in the river section but i really like mother amy mother amy amy's mother but i really like amy as a mother and mother. i don't want to go into it too much because again it's so interwoven within river storyline but i think it's such a great storyline like if anything i think they could have like lent on the grief a bit more like when amy loses her baby like and you realize that the, the baby is the flesh and she's like screaming at this baby i think that we could have like had a bit more trauma as the next episode she's a bit like doctor have you found river yet like have you found her um but i like that when river I like that she got to raise Melody in a way. Like in some way she has a little joy in knowing that she still had a hand in raising her daughter and like the morals that she has. But then even when River keeps like popping back to visit them, she's like, hi, mum. Like, hi, hi, River. Like it's very like mum and daughter, even though they're very mm -hmm. like living separate lives. And I know we don't know much about it beyond the lockdown short, but I do, I do feel happy knowing that she got, the son that she adopted in the 30s or 40s wherever it was yes well where better to go from miss amelia pond in this discussion about the revival companions than on to her husband mr rory williams rory williams played by none other than arthur darville and once again we've written a handy biography for you if you need to come back up to speed with rory's story we meet rory as a nurse and amy's sort of boyfriend after the doctor pops out of a cake at his stag party he learns that amy tried to kiss the doctor Starting with a romantic break to meet vampires, Rory joins the Doctor and Amy for adventures, sharing a bunk bed together in the TARDIS and creating a regenerating baby. In 2012 Wales, Rory is tragically erased from existence and Amy's memory. He miraculously returns in 102 AD as an Auton soldier with Rory's memories, a side effect of a trap set by the Doctor's enemies. To keep Amy safe, he volunteers to guard her body in the Pandora for millennia, becoming the last centurion. After the universe is reset and Rory becomes human again, he's restored to his original timeline, marries Amy, keeping bits of his Auton memories. Did you know that, by the way, that he keeps some of the Auton memories? I didn't realise that, but he does. Yeah, because there's a conversation about it where, where Amy, I think Amy says it about him or he says it, and he's like, I remember like fragments. He's like, I remember bits. So interesting. There was a whole thread I saw as well on Reddit, which was like, if Rory was an Auton for 2,000 years, why is he still stupid? And I was like, that's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> that's very mean. On the next adventures, he has run-ins with his daughter, also childhood best friend, faces Amy's aged doppelganger, hits elderly woman in a psychic dream, dies and resurrects several more times, and is eventually made to leave the TARDIS to live with his wife by the Doctor. Amy and Rory are briefly set to divorce after Amy worries that Rory would be happier with someone else, as she's become infertile and knows that Rory wants to have children. A run-in with the Daleks and a Clara splinter, however, brings them back together. Their last adventure sends them back in time to 1930s New York. Trapped by Weeping Angels, Rory and Amy jump to their deaths to save each other. They're sent back in time and separated from the Doctor forever leaving behind an adopted son, Anthony Brian Williams. Oh, is that said anywhere other than in that lockdown short? Um, I think it was a deleted scene, maybe, rather than a, than a short. Because they had, no, you're right. Yeah, I think because the deleted scene was Brian, Rory's dad, Brian, finding the letter. But then Rory did the video recording from lockdown. But I couldn't remember which one, but I think you're right. I think it's the deleted scene. So maybe scene. both. Maybe both, maybe both. Well... Oh, Rory. Got to love the last century. Give me a take on Rory. Give me your hottest, hottest take on Rory. My hottest, hottest take on Rory. Oh my God. Do you know what, actually? I'm going to start here. This is kind of in the middle of my notes, but I'm going to start here. I really like that Rory is the type of character he is. He is a straight man. He's a nurse. He comes from a small town. And I think that Doctor Who... You like that he's a straight man? Yes. That's your take. I, no, let me finish my take before you so <laughs> rudely interrupt me. I think that Doctor Who needs to show more male characters like Rory. I don't think by any stretch of the definition it was a conscious decision by Stephen Moffat. Like now, I think Russell is very conscious like, oh, you know, we need to teach young boys to be like this. So we're going to include characters uh, like this and we're going to include uh, doing this. And it's all very conscious decisions to try and have a positive effect on the world. I don't think that Rory was necessarily written with that in mind, but I think there's something really important to be said about having male characters who are uh, sweet and are there to support their wife and the 
doing roles that so many people stereotype as a gendered role. And Rory is just so not the quote unquote conventional male hero that one would assume would be on a show like this. I think outside of Doctor Who World, like in Doctor Who World, I think we're like, oh my God, like, of course Rory makes sense. Of course Rory belongs here. But I just think it's really important to be showing this type of man on screen because I don't think that it is shown enough, in my opinion. I really, really like that. And I think that is my hottest take, I guess, about Rory. That's a great hot take. And I think I'd agree with that, except that I would probably suggest that that is the intentional representation that maybe they went with, was that maybe. Rory is an emotionally vulnerable man. He's got a caring instinct in him. He cares desperately about his girlfriend and wife more than anyone else in the world he adores her he is the ultimate simp for her he thinks that she is just <laughs> the most glorious thing in the world there's that whole line about like your girlfriend isn't more important than the whole universe she is to me yeah um and rory the nurse as well pairing with that is a really lovely touch on that character lots of moments where that caring instinct comes through and i guess a parallel as well you know like the doctor is the doctor but rory is a nurse and that he literally on various adventures tends to people when they're hurt and mm -hmm. and and shows that empathy and i think that is a really positive thing to show in 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 terms of kind of what a male hero in a sci-fi looks like is nice mm -hmm. i like it I like it too. And he's also just really funny. I love his, he gets some cracking dialogue. There's a bit I love in The Girl Who Waited where the robot's like asking him a question. He's like, like with the doctor backing away, like, what's the answer to not get us killed? Like he, he always feels like he's kind of being dragged on these adventures. And I, I think he gets some cracking dialogue. It is good. And that's, you know, why he's kind of ready to go earlier. He also has a good banter with um, Matt Smith's doctor by the end, even though at the start they kind of begin as like rivals, even though the doctor doesn't necessarily want to be that but um by the end it's like oh that's my favorite car how do you know that's my favorite car oh because you showed me a picture once and said that's my favorite car yeah exactly. <laughs> and they've got exactly. this kind of like you know friendship happening um which which is really cool they've got their own sort of relationship that happens there yeah no exactly Go on, what, what's your hottest rory take i think that was probably it i just think i think the thing that's really lovely about rory is his like absolute loyalty um that's what I really, really like. And um, his 2,000 years as the centurion is always like the most mind-boggling thing for me. I mean, yes, talk about the Doctor doing 4 billion years in a confession dial or whatever. Mm. But that's such an insane length of time that it almost like fails to be plausible or even like possible to imagine what that is like. Mm. Whereas Rory doing 2,000 years, you can, you can kind of conceptualize 2,000 years of history and what that would feel like. Um, Hard to imagine what he would have done all that time as well, like no sleeping, no eating, presumably like no friendships or relationships, just kind of Can't like get close anonymously to standing outside a box all those years. Yeah. Um, it's funny though that his character emerges from that period the same, the same yeah. accent, the same voice, the same reactions. And due to like the pacing of the episode that happens in, and I'm talking about this because I just saw it, <laughs> but... um no one really quizzes him on that either when they come back they're not like oh my god like rory bloody hell like <laughs> how are you like mentally how are you or like the doctor didn't actually even check in at like 100 year intervals he was like i will actually just meet you at the end and did i was like rory well done and that was it <laughs> yeah uh, and amy was like rory thanks and yeah literally it. no literally i mean it's it, there's that subplot in asylum of the daleks which i do think dear listeners we may be we may be visiting at some point in the near future um mm. where when they're having the storyline of that they're divorcing because it seems on screen that rory i mean like you said he's so devoted to his wife i love that like amy's constantly battling between whether life in the tardis or life at home is more important for her rory always know life with his wife and life on earth is the important quote-unquote real life and tardis adventures are a fun extra thing and i like that we have to really face in like words that when they're arguing and why they're divorcing and, and and all of this, Amy says like, "What is it? What is it?" And Rory knows. Well, we both know. Like, there's no point in saying it. And she's like, "What do you mean?" Amy genuinely doesn't know what you're talking about. He goes, "We both know that I love you more than you love me." And to Rory, that's just like a fact of the matter. He's like, "Everyone knows mm. it." And to her, mm. that is shocking to her because it's so not true. But I think it's just because he shows his love 
in so many more like and you know what people say like love languages and stuff and his is like actions and he has like eight different ones and she maybe has like one um but it's so shocking to her to think that people would think that he loves her more than she loves him even though from an outside perspective that is like how it looks and i think that was a really like important conversation to have yes yes the other thing i like about rory a lot is that he challenges the doctor because the doctor's kind of shine doesn't work on him yeah he's a little bit immune i think to the doctor's charm for some reason it doesn't quite rub off on him in the same way maybe because of the way they met with him popping out of a cake at a stag party Mm. but even like entering the tardis he's like oh go on you're probably wondering how it's possible and rory's like oh it's another dimension and he's like yes yeah yeah <laughs> like, yeah that I did is my it, research. Actually. yeah it's like well yeah it makes sense blah, blah, blah. and it's like oh right okay um and and rory is also able to give the doctor a bit of a smackdown a smackdown sounds violent is it called <laughs> a smackdown or a talking down <laughs> maybe I think it's, it's probably term. a talking down he, he a knocks smack- down a peg or two <laughs> gives a smackdown. i imagine them in like a wwe like let's cage. get ready to <laughs> rumble <laughs> He has this bit where he says, you don't realize how dangerous you are because you make people want to impress you. He says, you don't realize how dangerous you make people to themselves. Yes, there we are. And because you you make them want to impress you. And I think Rory probably isn't totally immune from that, but Mm. he's certainly right in terms of how other people behave around him. And the way they all sacrifice themselves around the doctor and the kind of behavior the doctor inspires in people kind of yeah maybe makes people kind of push their own kind of mortality to the side a bit and forget like the danger they're he, in he foresaw clara i mean he's li- i mean it's the true with so many companions but that's exactly what ends up happening with clara is that she flies a bit too close to the sun she thinks companions have a habit of because they see what the doctor does and gets away with they're like well i can do that too and then it's fine until it's not and it's exactly the same with amy and rory like it's the adventure that you know if they just hadn't had that little trip to new york if they had just bought a plane ticket because that's new york in present day as well if they had just bought a plane (laughs) ticket and gone themselves this probably wouldn't have happened um but yeah it's just the, the adventure that goes wrong i actually as you were saying about that quote and stuff i kind of forget because the vampires of venice i'd like to revisit at some point because i kind of think of it as a sort of mid episode like it's fine it's an okay doctor episode but it's a really good amy and rory episode and it's specifically a really good rory episode because i think that rory could have potentially become a bit of like a mickey where you know we pop in on him every so often maybe he comes on like Mm. the odd trip in the tardis but he's very much like a side character and i think that this is where we as the audience start to really care about rory and obviously he still isn't a full series regular. He has a few episodes, you know, he gets wiped away from time. But by the end of series five, he is established as a companion in exactly the same way that Amy is. Like Amy and Rory are the companions rather than Amy being the companion and Rory being her sometimes boyfriend. And I think that solidifying him and the TARDIS team in that way and having them as like a trio was the best thing they could have done. Mm-hmm. Because I really think that you need you need a Rory there to stop Amy becoming a Clara, you know? Yeah, yeah. I like what you're saying about him him foreseeing Clara is a really interesting one, which reminded me as well, as a different point, how well Rory and Clara briefly bounce off each other in the Asylum of the Daleks. It's not the original mm. Clara, it's a version of Clara in Oswin Oswald, one of my favourite Clara splinters, if not my favourite. <laughs> um, she starts calling him Nina, right? And yeah. she's like, oh, I uh, had a crush on a Rory once, actually, she was called Nina. Um, <laughs> I think she then starts calling him Nina. She's like, uh, right, pop your clothes off quick as you like. And he's like, why? And she's like, just because, just because. <laughs> think you're hot. I just thought that was fun. And Rory just does not warm to that until Rory is not remotely interested. <laughs> he's just like, no, not what? at all. He's like, I love my wife, but he is divorcing, but he loves her all the He same. loves his wife. He doesn't want anyone else. Yeah. Um, anyway, that made me laugh. One last thing I want to say about Rory, because I don't think we can really talk about his era without it is how many times he dies i think he probably dies more than any other companion i tried to work it out and without properly going through and telling up i couldn't really work it out but some of the ways he dies is he was shot by silurian he was mm-hmm. wiped and erased from history he turned into an auton and then history refreshed and that version of him died he fake died in the tardis where in journey where in the doctor's wife he like 
grew so old that he was sort of hating Amy and became a skeleton. But that all turned out to be an apparition and that wasn't real. <laughs> he was then touched by an angel quite a lot and ended up in like a battery farm where he just kept growing old and dying and growing old and dying being sent back. Mm -hmm. Then he had a suicide pact with Amy where they jumped down and killed themselves to destroy the paradox. Then he was touched by an angel again and grew out his life in the 1930s. This man died a lot. He died so many times. It became a joke mm -hmm. about how many times they killed Rory. They keep killing Rory. I think, obviously, you know, you do something too many times and it, it, it the effect of it like waves off. I do really, really like the first death because Doctor Who hadn't properly killed off a companion in the modern era. And I know, obviously, they then went to undo it, but, like, you know, Ro uh, Rose lived in a parallel world. Martha is on Earth. Donna had her memories erased. Amy was going on. But at that time in Series 5, when they shot Rory and he died... And he was actually like dead. Yeah. And then the crack erased him. I was like, holy shit. Like this, he's <laughs> dead. Like, it, like there are consequences to this. They killed my girl. They killed my girl. That was my, what have they done? <laughs> They've kind of killed him. Um, yeah. And I just thought that was <laughs> really, uh, really poignant. And I'm, I'm glad that they did that. Even though they then, you know, it did become a bit of a running gag. I'm glad that they, I'm glad they had that moment. Yeah. They had to make his, his final death feel final. And I, I think we can say they, they nailed that. Well, We've talked about mother. We've talked about daddy. I think we've got to get on to daughter, Miss River Song. I was about to say mummy. She's not mummy. I think of <laughs> no, River she is, as mummy. But... I think River's more mother than Amy. I'd, if I was going to call any of these three mother, I think I'd call River mother more than... I think Amy is mum and River is mother. Is there any other new Who companion who's been a mum? I'm just trying to think. Apart from Amy? Donna. Donna. Of course. Donna is now. Apart from Donna, though. And... From expanded universe, Martha is in Farewell, Sarah Jane. We learn that Martha and Mickey uh, had a son, and I do wonder when we get her inevitable return. Let me clown. Yeah, uh, if they will canonize that or not, because uh... and I think in Titan Comics as well, we learn that Tentu and Rose had twins. I think. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, good for good them. For them. Well, on to River Song, River Song. <laughs> played by Alex Kingston. River Song, government name Melody Pond, is the secret daughter of Amy and Rory. Melody has unique abilities like Time Lord Regeneration because she was conceived in a bunk bed on the TARDIS by Amy and Rory, getting exposure to the Time Vortex. The Doctor's enemies use this to their advantage after they identify Melody as a potential weapon to use against him. They kidnap Amy and swap her with a flesh copy while they await Melody's birth. While the Doctor manages to rescue Amy, he fails in saving Melody, who vanishes with the silence, alien cultists who want to prevent the Doctor from ever revealing his name. That's... That's plot. That's a lot of plot. The Doctor, Amy, and Rory meet a little girl in a spacesuit in 1969. Though they don't know it, the child is Melody, and the story ends with her regeneration in an alleyway. Later, River, calling herself Mel's, travels to England and becomes childhood friends with her own parents. As an adult, she finally meets the Doctor properly, and she regenerates into the familiar form of Alex Kingston as River Song, revealing her true identity to Amy and Rory. After attempting to kill Hitler, for no reason other than she felt like it, she was transported to the future to train as an archaeologist to look for the Doctor throughout history. The Doctor gives her a blank diary to record their encounters from her perspective. When she graduates, she's abducted and forced to fulfil her destiny as the person who kills, wink wink, the Doctor. The Doctor marries her and she goes to prison. River has adventures with the Doctor, mainly the 11th, during various escapes and excursions from the prison and eventually becomes pardoned. She meets the 12th Doctor and after realising who he is, spends her last night with him on Derillium. But it's fine because it's 24 years. <laughs> the next time she meets the 10th Doctor at the library and she was surprised to find that he didn't recognise her. She sacrifices herself in the library, but she's saved as a data ghost in the library computer. In the name of the Doctor, River returns via hmm, magic, talking with a Paternostagan, Clara Oswald, and eventually the Doctor via a psychic connection, even manifesting champagne. They share one final kiss as she bids goodbye to the man she loves. Ah, uh, what a... <laughs> what a character what arc. What a character arc. I almost feel like we were debating with this episode whether we should talk about just Amy and Rory or Amy Rory River. And I think that it is at least the surface level worth talking about all three of them because they're such like a family unit. But River Song's story, I mean, we genuinely could give her a whole episode of herself. And if you'd like that, dear listener, please let us know. But I think the main thing we need to start with with River is that Alistair so beautifully uh, put together that biography of River Song's life on screen. You're welcome. But for us as the audience that was shown to us in a completely different order. And I think that there are two ways you can think about River Song, either chronologically through her timeline, which is how we just described it there, or chronologically through the time that we see her on screen. 
And I think that it was such a smart move and a really good use of foresight from Stephen Moffat. I wonder if he already knew that he was going to be brought on a showrunner when he wrote River in Science and Library, because this was within Russell T. Davies' era. So just so you know, uh, the dates that we saw River Song, she first appeared in Science and Library on the 31st of May 2008, and her final appearance was in The Husbands of River Song, the 2015 Christmas special on the 25th of December 2015. And I think it was such a great bit of foresight to tease us this character who meets the Doctor at the end of her timeline. And I remember when series four finished and the specials finished being like, oh, they never wrapped up that River Song storyline. I wonder what we're planning on doing with that. Oh, baby, if I knew. Oh, oh baby, if I knew. They have plenty more to come. They have more to come. I don't know if he kind of planned it that he was like, you know, if I ever come back and write a few more episodes, maybe that's someone I'll bring back in the wrong order and I'll kind of pepper that in. Or if at that point there was any idea of, uh, there must have been a pretty good idea actually becoming showrunner because that was series four that he wrote that. And series five was next, so there must have been conversations happening. I I don't know, because I mean, I'm assuming that when writing series four, they didn't have the specials planned and certainly hadn't written them. And I just don't know how much would have been put into thinking whether or not Russell was going to be there any longer. So I'm just thinking by the time they were commissioning him to write these episodes... I don't imagine he knew for sure he would have been showrunner coming up. Like, I just can't imagine it would have been that early. But I don't know, maybe it was. There's something still, I think, about reading that arc in order that feels that a lot of this was not planned from the get-go. Mm. A lot of this was done later to fit in with a different storyline. Um, I agree. It it kind of works. It's messy. Uh, you certainly need a flowchart. Um, <laughs> I think all of this creates a sense that River is kind of still out there which isn't necessarily a bad thing yeah. and that she can kind of come back anytime. And I guess in a way she can, because there's any number of escapes from Stormfront or um, nights that she can leave Derillium or whatever, you know, ways that River can keep popping back in. Um, yeah. Or indeed, even now, like apparitions of River kind of as like a data ghost kind of turning up as a psychic connection, which is bananas at the end when you really think about it she was literally kind of an image of river saved in the cloud yeah and yet she manages to physically kiss the doctor was, i know was impressive i love the poetic start of the story that the first time he sees her is the last time she sees him but then as with a lot of things in tv in general but specifically with doctor Who, where you go back and forth with the characters and they come in they come out and especially a character like river where time travelers well and she's seeing each other in the wrong order these clean lines start blurring and so it it would make sense if the first time she sees him is the last time he sees her, and then the last time he sees her is the first time she sees him. That would have been a good way to kind of like bookend it, I guess. But obviously that's not the way it planned out. And I also feel like with River Song, she never got like a clear definitive end in that it seemed like her end was going to be Silence Night Before Us the Dead. Then they brought her back again for the name of the Doctor, where it's like, oh, actually, no, that wasn't the very end for her. She had a bit more. And then they did the Husbands of River Song where they were like, oh, but actually in the middle there was this other bit you didn't see. And I think, like you said, you get away with it because River does have these adventures out of order. And I think from looking into it, uh, River's actually met every single incarnation of the Doctor at different points throughout expanded media. I think in Big Finish, every surviving Doctor has had a story, including River Song. And then she's had adventures mm-hmm. as well with like the first Doctor and stuff. But that does sort of like blur the lines of this like clean poetic story of like, you don't know who I am, I know who you are. But that's just the nature of storytelling, I guess. I love the effortless sass that alex kingston brings to everything it's in the face it's in the line delivery it's in just every part of the way that everything's delivered it's in the big curly hair it's in the outfits um there's something just so powerful about her performances river that i really really like there's a part that i really like when she escapes stormfront mm. um which is always great fun when she does her little like very casual escapes a she gets out by kind of like tricking um the guard with psychic lipstick and he's like huh, you're not gonna get away isn't it storm cage is it storm? what i keep calling it? what's stormfront i don't know i'm pretty sure it's storm cage and the storm cage facility let me what what have i been saying oh oh no <laughs> stormfront is a neo-nazi internet forum okay ah! River, River is not associated with, whoops, River Song is not associated with She her. killed Hitler. And um, she escapes with her psychic lipstick, which is like, of course she'd have psychic lipstick. And all she has to do is smooch a guard. And then she like draws a river on the wall with big curly hair going like, bye. And this guy is like <laughs> aiming his gun at a drawing that she's done on the wall. Like, Your tricks don't work on me, Dr. Song. <laughs> Your tricks don't work on me. <laughs> it's like, yes, they do. 
And then she kind of just like quite effortlessly like hops from A to B to C, blackmailing people to just get hold of like the tools she needs to be able to mm. time travel. And even when she arrives in Roman Britain, doesn't just stop there and kind of hide out. She convinces them with a psychic lipstick that she is Cleopatra. Yeah. She's a really fun match to the Doctor as well, because she's got this like moral greatness, but she doesn't stray into anything like the Master's territory. Everything she kind of does most of the time is kind of like naughty. She's yeah. a naughty character. Um, she's a little minx. She's a little minx, but I think when she's working with the Doctor, she sort of steers clear of that. I think outside of their yeah. time together, she's naughtier. She works really well, I think, opposite Amy as well, because while, especially Series 5 Amy, is quite... Um, comparatively timid a little bit more apprehensive a bit more scared in these situations river brings this like real confidence and knowledge also she leans into the chaos a bit more like you know something mm -hmm. awful is about to happen and it's like they're both finding it a little bit exciting the doctor and river together in a way that you know amy shouldn't that's that's frightening for yeah. a normal companion but um yeah exactly yeah, I think that it's the thing about River being at the point in her life at most times we meet her where she has an adventure with the Doctor and then like lives a life off screen. So she is growing. I think by the end, isn't she like 200 years old or something? Oh my God, no. Really? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think in The Husband's River Song, she says something like, oh, I'm like 200 years old and I look great for my age or something. I guess she would be, yeah. Yeah, because she has a lot of life off screen without the Doctor. So I like that when she is seeing the Doctor, especially like I said in The Time of Angels where the Doctor is so young to her that she can kind of be like, right, we, we're going to do this. I know what's going on here. Um, I completely agree with you about her character traits. I had notes here that said, she's such a great character. Fun, funny, sassy, emotional, and truly in love with the Doctor. I think that it really was the story of a love story. And I like that it cut mm. the four of them as in the Doctor Amy Rory River kind of become a real family unit. There's a lot of family units in Doctor Who. Um, but I think that they, in a very literal sense, as well as like the metaphorical sense of like bonding, they really are a family. I like as well that- They are a little family. They really are. And I, I like the differences between like River Song and Melody Pond. And I think River has three different bodies, like three generations, the little girl from the Impossible Astronaut, Mel, and then Alex Kingston's River Song. There's so much more I love about River. I love how she can fly the TARDIS perfectly. And she's like the only one who actually knows kind of the rules because the TARDIS kind of showed her how to do it. And even though the Doctor taught her, the TARDIS kind of corrected him. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like bits that she knows how to do. And she's got this joke in there about like, it only makes that noise because you leave the brakes on. <laughs> she catches things he misses. She challenges him. I love companions that challenge the Doctor as well. She really understands his nature, very much like Donna in that sense. Yeah. And she, you know, knows when to try and rein him in. Again, great line in the Pandorica um about uh just this time you have to run you have to run away it's too dangerous but of course he doesn't listen to that mm. a flop for me is this whole kind of dialogue about her being a psychopath because to me river is not a psychopath and the doctor is not a psychopath and maybe they have manipulative traits or they have like you know morally ambiguous kind of ways of doing things or maybe they even are killers at times but they're not psychopaths yeah. and i always find that a frustrating thing that's something that i think is like a bit of a steve moffatism mm. and it's something that he did a lot in sherlock as well was talk a lot about psychopaths and people being psychopaths without i think really knowing what that means or mm. just kind of deliberately misusing it like it, it, to go back to like a true like psychological definition i think even then i don't think you know a real psychologist would use like the term psychopath but in terms of like uh, like what a, psych a psychopath is meant to be like River is not a psychopath and people have made this argument a lot better than I would bother doing right now <laughs> um, or could do. Um, but she she very much loves people. She truly loves the Doctor. She loves Amy and Rory. She tries to do the right thing. She sacrifices herself for other people. Um, maybe she was raised to be a psychopath and they try to make her like a cold, unfeeling killer. But I don't think that's what um river really is yeah there's a line in there which i'll i'll take as a joke but this whole thing about like oh we can't travel together because only one psychopath per tardis please mm. um is is bizarre to me i don't think either one of them is is a psychopath i think that for me yeah i agree with you i don't think river's a psychopath either i she keeps saying she is but i think it's because she's been trained i think they have told her she is i think that she thinks that i think that madame kavarian and the silence tried to build her into something that she just inherently isn't i feel like the daughter of amy and rory and friend of the doctor couldn't be inherently 
evil or bad or psychotic. And I think they're just telling her that she is something so much that she believes them because that's what she's been told. And her being a psychopath comes out in, especially in Let's Kill Hitler, of her, you know, manipulating people's emotions. She's getting to know Amy and Rory, even though she knows she's their daughter. She's getting the doctor closer. She gives him the kiss and she's so cold and she doesn't care and she's carrying out her mission. And those are the psychopathic behaviours. But no, I, I completely agree with you. I don't think Rivers is a psychopath. I also think it's just a really... They kind of built this storyline up a lot that, you know, I'm a psychopath, I'm a psychopath, I'm going to be a psychopath, whatever, whatever. And it gets really quickly resolved and let's go Hitler. Like it, it kind of ties off the loose end of River not being able to regenerate anymore because she puts all of the rest of it into the doctor as a sign of, as an act of love and to show that she actually isn't a psychopath. But it just got wrapped up really, really quickly. That line you said about as well, about like, you know, only one psychopath per TARDIS. I, yeah, I think that's just a bit of an iffy line as well. I do wonder sometimes what a full series of The Doctor and River would have been. I'm glad we didn't get it because I think she works best as like a pop in, pop out character. And I think that they would have had to have some like definitive end for why she leaves the TARDIS at the end of that series. Whereas I think she works best when she is always in the Doctor's life, but she's never in it fully she's always popping yes, in and out yes um but what more can i say so much that i loved i mean a, a highlight for me as well watching today making a dalek beg for mercy like you know you're an associate of the doctor you'll never kill me and it's like i'm river song check your data banks again mercy say it again mercy one more time like oh it's so good she has some really great one lines i'm river song check your records again yeah like, Oh, and I mean, like it—it it doesn't really come off the back of that point, real. But she's talking about her good lines. I love the little speech we get in her last episode. I mean, I'd love—I bloody love to see River. I would love River to be a character that just comes back every, every Doctor, one episode every Doctor. But in the episode with uh, Capaldi's twelfth Doctor, where she says like the Doctor doesn't love me, the Doctor isn't stupid enough or like care enough or, or sentimental enough to be mm. standing here by my side. And then she turns to him, and and he's there. And I just think that's just such a gorgeous little scene. I have a fun fact actually about. Um... River's ending, oh, dying in the it. library, that I don't think we talked about before. Um, so I didn't know this, but Dr. Moon was actually kind of written or dreamed up as the 45th and final Doctor by Stephen oh. Moffat and Russell T. Davies. So they refer to the story as the very last scene in Doctor Who. Um, though Moffat admitted the idea would likely have never made it to the screen, it interestingly suggests that whether or not he knew it, Colin Salmon technically played the 45th Doctor, or rather a post-mortem Doctor. Oh, so like, because he's in the library, that's like a version of his consciousness in the library. Yes, so it's, like an, it's, like, a, it's like an upload yeah. of the Doctor. So Dr. Moon that's looking after the library Dr. kind Moon. of is a Doctor uploaded there as well. I mean... I'm not going to lie, and I'm not being funny. We've got enough little broken away David Tennant's that one of them could regenerate into him at some point, and it wouldn't really matter. No. Um, interesting, <laughs> though, that, that the <laughs> number that might have like, suggested there is the 45th Doctor. Not yeah. I mean, off the back of that, and nothing to do with River Song, when do we think... Do we think Doctor Who will ever stop? And if so, what Doctor will it stop with? 45? Well, how far are we now? How many... We had, we had sort of eight, we're at 15. Eight, eight classic Doctors, and we're now at seven well more yeah, than seven we're new doctors at, we're at 15 in real numbers but then we also have yeah the fugitive the war, doctor the fugitive. and the war doctor and then we've got a few like you know 10 twos yeah and stuff. so we're we're well over kind of matching what classic did i mean there's no limit is there there's really no the limit, limit doesn't exist the limit doesn't exist yeah I don't know. I think didn't in the Sarah Jane Adventures, the Eleventh Doctor says something like two thousand regenerations or something to Clyde. He's, he's making it. He's just, saying, he's just saying anything. He's making up. He's just saying he's just stuff. Doing anything. Yeah. How did you feel about this little package of companions, Sam? Did you enjoy revisiting some of them? I loved revisiting them. Thank you so much for asking. No, I really did. I, I like I said, I have to kind of remind myself how much I love this era of Doc 2 because I am so nostalgic for Russell's era because it was like the era that brought me into the show. But we both yeah. properly grew up on the Doctor, Amy, Rory and River. And yeah. revisit them for this, it just makes me want to watch more series five, six and seven episodes because they are so good. And I think they have such strong storylines. There's definitely like faults within them. And there's definitely some like meh episodes, I think, dotted in there. But that's true of any era. Um, mm. I really, really love this. I'm really glad that we, in this Revival Companions episode of Hula La, looked at the three of them as a little package because they, they do really come together. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because we were saying that these episodes kind of started just as we were sort of starting to become teenagers. And so we remember them in quite a different way. And yeah our era of doctor who was very much like series one to four 
that we grew up with, and that's when we had the action figures and the DVDs. But we very much still watch this, but just at a different time in our lives, perhaps. We're I've still starting. got the DVDs and the action figures and series I four. Show show show. I've got the series seven DVD box at home. <laughs> Don't you be shy about it. Um, you, of course, you had the action figures. Of course, you did. Does anyone remember collecting? Doc 2 Series 5 action figures and getting a CD, which was a half, a half, which was a sixth of the Pandorica. And if you've got all six figures, they click together to make a Pandorica to scale. But each side of it with the green light was a CD that had a Doc 2 audio adventure on it. Oh, that's a good idea. It came up with mm-hmm. that. It was fun. Meanwhile, character options. <laughs> character options, probably. What are you doing right now? <laughs> Truly, what are you doing? Oh, folks, my God, what I are you know. doing? Let, I've heard a few whispers and rumours about what may be coming, but I, it's yet to come now, so I'm really, I'm ready for it. They are slacking. They are slacking. What about you, Asa? Do you like this little visit back to the past? I did enjoy revisiting. It's funny as well, like, with the fairy tale era, if you will, that this feels almost so much more thematically close to what we got with, like, the Church from Ruby Road and even the 60th specials. Mm. It feels so much closer. I think a lot of people expected that an RTD return, and maybe part of this is where some of the disappointment came from for the specials, was going to be simply a return to kind of almost like Series 1, 2005's style. Yeah. With the whole kitchen sink, soap opera, very grounded, very gritty Doctor Who. And instead it feels like what we got is a lot more Moffaty. Yeah. And if we had this whole kind of like in the Moffat era, like um, kind of like science as magic, Mm -hmm. now that RTD is like, we're taking a step into kind of myth, it's just magic as magic, mm-hmm. but I can imagine it kind of like almost thematically taking a bit of a similar, uh, a similar kind of uh, avenue. It feels like maybe Moffat. It feels like maybe Russell T Davies was kind of watching these episodes. I'm sure he was right, right after you would depart. Oh yeah, with with a lot of interest and thinking. This is pretty good. Mm-hmm. This is pretty good. And then coming back, I you know probably thought I don't want to just do what I did before again. Let me try and build on what's happened since. No, I love it. It really does. Yeah. I mean, we've said it a million times before and I'll say it one last time. It won't be the last time. This era of these companions truly did just feel like the fairy tale era. And I love it. They really are magical. They're magical. They're a magical little trio. They're a wonderful family. And it was nice to be back with the ponds for a little bit. I love my visit with the Ponds. And I hope you, dear listener, enjoyed your visit with the Ponds too. Please, if you did enjoy, reach out to us on all of our social media. You can find us on Twitter, the, well, the app formerly known as Twitter, it's now known as X, Instagram, TikTok, and threads, all of which are at Hula La Pod. And as always, you can listen to old episodes of the podcast on our YouTube channel, also at Hula La Pod. And if you're feeling really generous, you can leave us a review on Apple or Spotify or Google or Amazon or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Uh, five stars is always recommended. And we'd love it if you can share the podcast with someone who you think might enjoy it uh, or put it on your story or tweet about it or reply to us at Hoodala Pod. Yeah, we've recently had people emailing us and I love people emailing us. I love getting this. It feels very official. Uh, you can always reach out to us on email, which is hoodalapod at gmail.com. I love that. That's very right to us at PO Box 10016. Love London W1A. <laughs> it's very, very that. Um, and we look forward to having you with us next week where we'll be watching Love and Monsters featuring very special guest Hamish Steele, the director of Netflix's Dead End animated series. Oh, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. And I hope you can't wait either, dear listener. We're very excited to see you back then. Well, thank you so much for listening and we will see you next week. See you soon. Bye. Bye.